Um, so just uh, just before I get into the message, I would encourage you to join with me today in the Word. And um, there's going to be a couple of spots where I'm going to be turning to other passages. We'll mainly be in the First Thessalonians 5 passage, but there are a couple of other portions of Scripture that um, I'm going to read uh, together with us. And I would encourage you to grab your Bible. And sometimes we you know, the online thing, it, it becomes easy to um, get, uh, how do I say this kindly, um, to get lazy uh, sometimes, uh, and I understand that fully, and it's easy to just watch something happen in front of you without really engaging, but of course, part of what we want to do in this time is to actually uh, engage in, in what's being talked about, sung about, prayed about, and so forth. And so um, just uh, I, I'll give you uh, a moment to grab that Bible if you haven't already got it and, and join us in 1 Thessalonians 5 and then a couple other passages that I'll give us in a, in a moment. Anyway, um, let me just uh, begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the service that we've uh, been a part of so far, and uh, everyone who's uh, participated in that. Thank you for the body of Christ, and, and thank you for the way that we are able to minister one amongst another, even in this um, uh, limited way. And so we give you thanks today for your word, and I pray that you would use it to encourage and strengthen and uh, draw us to yourself. Uh, I pray that as we spend this time together, um, your words would sink deep within our heart and that we would just be um, uh, strengthened to carry on serving you, living for you, and, and walking with you day by day. And so may your Holy Spirit uh, do that work within each of our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we have spent uh, some time, this is really kind of still a part of the, the Christmas series that we began. You may remember um, a few weeks ago, we were in a couple of the Old Testament passages that were prophecies pointing forward to the first coming of Christ. And uh, we spent some good time together. And I know, I know it seems to you like that was already a year ago. Well, it was last year, wasn't it? And welcome to 2021. This is a new year. Um, we can now officially say that uh, 2020 is hindsight. We can officially say that. It is in our past. And uh, we can be thankful that uh, uh, we, we put that behind us and we launch forward into this new year seeing what it will bring, not really knowing uh, how everything will go, but that's not new, right? We never know the future. And so we can be encouraged in that we trust in the Lord and rely upon him at all times. And all is good uh, as we follow him. So we spent a couple of weeks talking about prophecy related to the first coming of Christ. Then uh, we're now spending a couple of weeks speaking of, or looking at passages that speak about the return of the Lord. So last week we were in 1 Thessalonians 4 and talked about some things from that perspective. And then in, uh, today in chapter 5 here in 1 Thessalonians, uh, because we need to know what is it that we are to be doing. Um, if, if the Lord is to return, and he is, then what are we to be doing as we await that return? Do we simply um, sit on our hands? Do we just kind of uh, uh, do whatever we want? Or, or is there a, a sense in which God is calling us to live a certain way until he returns? And of course, that's the answer that, that we find in Scripture, that he is calling us to live a certain way. And um, we, don't, we don't spend as much time as we should talking about the return of the Lord. I think there are times that we neglect that. We get so caught up in the here and now and in what's happening this uh, week or this month. And we're looking at things from our perspective and how we're feeling or how something affects us. 
and we're not looking at the bigger picture necessarily. So the start of the year is a great time for us to look uh, to the Lord and to really uh, get his perspective. And the early church clearly had this anticipation of the Lord's return. And so we want to have that as well. So the passage here in front of us is, is very helpful, very instructive. And so we'll just kind of walk through a few things here. Uh, what are we as believers to do as we look to the future and await the return of the Lord? Well, I would say the first thing it tells us is that we're to be aware, to be aware. Begin reading at verse 1 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need um, to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. And he's saying, you are fully aware already. In other words, you have been told this already. And he's clearly speaking to believers here. And they've already received some instruction in the things of the Lord. And um, they are to be reminded of those things. But it is good for us to be aware, to, to be aware of the facts. And we talked a bit about that last time in relation to what we would refer to as the rapture spoken of in, in chapter 4. But then in chapter 5, we've got this general phrase for the day of the Lord. And, and that phrase can, can mean different things. Sometimes it's a general uh, phrase to refer to all of the events and moments that happen uh, when the Lord returns, all the things connected with that. Sometimes it's referring to a specific aspect within that. For instance, judgment. Quite often the day of the Lord does refer to a, a sense of God's judgment upon the world. And um, sometimes it's even referring to a specific period of God's judgment. Uh, uh, the tribulation would be an example of that. That seven-year period referred to specifically as a part of that day of the Lord. So you get different ways that that phrase is used, but it is a very important part that we focus ourselves upon that, that we look forward to what God will do in these moments, in, in this day in which he is to return. And so as part of that, then, um, we are aware of the fact that he's coming back. How do we know this? Well, you and I are blessed to have the word of God, which uh, tells us in many different places about his return. So uh, come with me to a, probably a passage that some of you already think of when you are, um, are reading these verses. If you were to compare, maybe I'll give you a moment and say to those in the room, what passage do you think I'm going to turn to now that would refer to some of the same things that are being spoken of as in 1 Thessalonians 5? Say to your neighbor, your friend, your, whoever is there with you, and, and some of you are thinking, I have no idea where he's going to go. And that's, that's all right, too. Uh, some of you are thinking, I think he's probably going to go to Matthew chapter 24 right now. Well, you would be exactly right. Matthew chapter 24. And I'm just going to read uh, some verses there. So I'm going to give you a moment to turn there. Matthew chapter 24. And I'm going to begin reading the, the entire chapter 24 and 25 are really applicable to uh, this day of the Lord and, and everything connected with it. But I'm just going to begin at verse 36. Verse 36 of Matthew chapter 24. So again, just, um, just allow the word of God to kind of speak to your hearts as, as we're informed here and become more aware of uh, the day of the Lord. It says in uh, verse 36, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the son of man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and one left. Two men will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and one left. Therefore, 
stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is, this, is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, that's, that's a great passage, and it speaks to a lot of different aspects of the return of the Lord. It speaks about that judgment as it refers to those who are rejecting the Lord, those who are against the Lord, and that they will be dealt with in the appropriate way at the appropriate time. The judge, the only true and righteous judge, God himself, uh, will determine their fate. And, and others then um, are, are caught unawares and by surprise. And so uh, that passage certainly does speak um, very much about what we read about in First Thessalonians. And so as we go back to that passage then, there is a suddenness that comes. There, unbelievers will be caught by surprise. Believers should be aware because they are um, uh, reading scripture and reminded of what God is saying and that God is returning. And so even though we do not know the day nor the hour, we should not be caught totally unaware. Uh, we, we know what is ahead. And that's a blessing that we have uh, that God has given to us in his word. But then there is also uh, this sense in which um, we, we grieve. Uh, because we realize that it will not be a pleasant day for, for uh, uh, many people who do not, for those who do not know the Lord. We, we rejoice because we will be with the Lord for eternity, but we grieve because we are mindful that others, uh, others who have not received the Lord do not have that same sense of expectation and anticipation of the joy that is before them. The faithful servant does. The unfaithful servant does not have that assurance. So we need to be aware. But the passage goes on in 1 Thessalonians to talk about not only being aware, but being alert. So it's, it's not just knowing, but then it's being ready with anticipation. Uh, it's, it's this sense of, of being ready to serve and help and, and do and go wherever and whenever needed. And, and it talks about this in verses uh, primarily six through eight, this idea of, of being awake and alert. Um, I, I should back up a little bit. Uh, let me back up to verse five. For you are all children of light, children of the day, we are not of the night or of the darkness. There's a difference between the unbeliever and the believer. The difference is as clear as light and darkness. And yes, we're once again referring to that theme that we talked about uh, before Christmas as well, that light and dark theme that can be seen all throughout Scripture, and it just keeps coming up in various places. It's reminding us this passage in Thessalonians written to believers, and it's saying we are, are people of the day. We are of the light. Uh, we are his children. And so there's a different destiny for us. So we can then live as, as Christians. Since we are called by God, chosen by God, justified by God, will be glorified by God, as we acknowledge all of these things that are ours in Christ, then it makes total sense that we live then in this in-between time we live as one who seeks to be an imitator of the Lord, seeks to honor him and follow him and walk with him. And so it tells us, uh, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake 
and be sober. And it talks about activities of the night. You, you sleep at night. Uh, some of the trouble that people get into happens at night and all the, that, that sort of idea. We are a people of the day. It doesn't mean we never go to sleep. It's not talking literal uh, sleep in that sense, but it is speaking to, to us about this alertness and awakeness that we are ready to roll and ready to help and serve the Lord. It's sort of this idea, um, maybe it's happened to you where you've just kind of been standing somewhere, uh, minding your own business and doing your own thing. And then uh, meanwhile, there's someone who's coming to a door and the door is right in front of you and they're struggling. They've got uh, uh, packages in their arms and, and it's hard for them to get the door open. And, and have you ever been in this spot where you're kind of just standing there looking at, and not really connecting the dots? You're, you're staring into space, really, not aware of that person. And then all of a sudden you kind of wake up and say, whoa, uh, I should help you right now. And I should be there to, to get that door for you. And then you jump into action and away you go. And, and there's a bit of that sort of thing here that as believers, we have the ability to jump in and help and serve and follow the Lord as appropriate. And as is, um, uh, that's what a Christian is called to do, to live uh, in, in light of the salvation that we have. But sometimes we're so sleepy in our own little world, uh, we just are not aware and we don't see the needs that are around us. And so this passage is pretty strong in its language that you know, we need to be a people who are awake. Now I'm going to go to another passage here that again speaks pretty similar, and I'm going to read Ephesians chapter 5. So turn with me now, if you would, uh, to Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, and here's what it says. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. Let, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who, it is, who is covetous that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and true and right. <clears throat> and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even, <coughs> excuse me, even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Now, I, I want to keep reading there, but I'll stop for sake of time. Um, that passage is just filled with some of the same thoughts that we're talking about from Thessalonians. And, and the idea for us to be awake and alert, to live as Christ has called us to live. That's what we are to be doing until the Lord returns. So we be aware, we know what's going to happen, and then we be alert and, and ready to live for the Lord. Just uh, don't, don't fall asleep on the job. Be the kind of person that is eager to serve the Lord. That should be uh, what we're about in this in between time. Thirdly, uh, it really tells us that we can have a sense of assurance. So we be aware, we be alert, but we have assurance in, in our salvation in Christ. So beginning at verse uh, 8, Since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, 
the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. In those verses, it is uh, a clear reminder that we can have assurance in our salvation in Christ, that we do not need to be filled with anxious worry, as David and Whitney reminded us about. It is a privilege for us to be able to say, our Redeemer is the one, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the one that we are living for. And he is the one, he's the whole reason that we are able to spend eternity with God. It is not in, a, in and of ourselves. It's not anything that we are able to do. And look at the words that are used in these verses. Uh, verse 8 speaks about the faith, the love, and the hope that is a part of our salvation. And it uses this language of a, a military uniform, a, putting on this armor, so to speak, this breastplate of faith and this helmet. Um, and the, the idea being that that's, that's what we're wearing. We're clothed in Christ. We, we are living, um, we are alive because he has given life to us through Christ Jesus. And therefore we are destined not for wrath. I think it's neat that it specifically mentions our destiny is not the wrath, the judgment of God, because Christ took that upon himself. But we then are blessed and privileged to be able to live with him for all of eternity. What a, uh, an encouraging thing that is. So we can have assurance uh, that our salvation is in Christ and walk confidently in that. And I think sometimes we struggle. Um, at times, we may have doubts or we may have fears about whether we truly belong to the Lord. And a passage such as this is a good reminder that, no, we, we walk in, in him. This, this faith, hope, and love, are, 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 we're, we're surrounded in that. We're surrounded in the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what gives us life. And so we rely upon that, not on our own um, efforts. And so that's a cool thing. Then the last part of this, and we are drawing this to a, a wrap up here in a moment, but it, you can be an encourager. Uh, you can be an encourager. Not only can you be aware and alert and have a sense of assurance, but you can be an encourager. And that is why this whole passage is, is here in front of us. It tells us in verse 11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. And you will remember that that's how chapter four ended as well, as it spoke to us about the, the, that part of the day of the Lord. It, it said at the end of chapter four, therefore encourage one another with these words. And here, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Um, several things about that little phrase, you know, uh, uh, someone has said that an encourager is um, someone who comes alongside and inputs courage into another. Where courage has faded away in their own life, encouragement is putting that courage back in them, refilling them with courage. That's an encourager, one who seeks to build another up. You know, uh, <clears throat> many of you know that we uh, re remodeled our basement in, in our home uh, over the last uh, couple of years. It took us that long. And uh, I remember the day that we started to rip things apart. And uh, there were several, some of you were there and uh, you were helping us as we ripped things out. And that went really fast. And I found that I could do that pretty well because it doesn't take a whole lot of skill to destroy something. And I was pretty good at destroying that old basement. Uh, but it took a little longer to rebuild, uh, to remodel, to redo 
what we were doing in the basement. And it took, I wasn't much help in a lot of those spots because it took someone with skill and someone with the ability to be able to do exactly what needed to be done. And that's how the rebuilding process went. So it was slower, but it was, uh, it was obviously the, the important part. We wanted the finished product. And so you need that building up. So here it says we're to be uh, the kind of people who build others up. And anybody can destroy somebody. You know, it takes no skill to do that. Sometimes we're really good at that. What we need to be better at is building others up to be able to encourage them and to strengthen them. Um, we live in some very challenging days and it is easy for folks to become discouraged. And so if you can be an encourager, that's a very valid ministry, especially in this in-between time as we wait for the day of the Lord, as we await uh, being in his presence forevermore. Because it, it, it doesn't happen as quickly as we might think, you know, uh, the Lord knows what is best. He's got the time frame figured out, and it's hard for us to be patient sometimes. But this is an, a, a very important part uh, of our responsibility, our role as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that it ends with that phrase, just as you are doing. In other words, there's some good news here. The good news is that when we look around us, we can see that God's people are encouraging one another. There are some things that are taking place. And, and God is, is saying to us, just, just keep on doing those good things. Keep on encouraging those individuals and, and use the, the gifts and abilities that God has given you to continue on in that. And so it's good that it mentions that just as you are doing. It's a, a good reminder there as well. All right, so those are very key, very important things. And what we're going to do is we're just going to pause now and, uh, and pray. And then we're going to transition to a time of communion. There's not going to be a song in between, uh, but we're just going to get ourselves prepared for that. Okay, and so um, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, Thank you for uh, your word, which truly does speak life and encouragement into our hearts and souls. Lord, we are um, so thankful for Jesus, our Savior. So thankful for all that has been accomplished at the cross of Calvary and at the empty tomb. May we take some time and reflect upon that now. We pray your blessing upon each one. Lord, maybe there's someone joining us today who um, needs some of that encouragement that we've been talking about. And I pray that your Holy Spirit, the one who lives within us and the one who empowers us and the one who comforts us and helps us, that you would help that individual today in their discouragement. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.